chapter 23, if you would. We were here last week also. We started into this chapter, and some of you might be wondering if you were not here last week or uh, if you've just tuned in to uh, the live stream to pick up our messages. You might have wondered, I thought, and thought this, I thought we were going to study the book of Revelation. What are we doing clear back in Leviticus 23? Well, last week I explained, and I'll give it to you again. This chapter, Leviticus 23, is so vitally important because here's what we have in this chapter. We have seven feasts. Uh, I'll show them to you here. I'm not going to run down over them uh, slowly. I'll go quickly. You have the Passover feast listed. You have the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. You've got seven of them listed in this chapter. That's what that chapter focuses on those feasts of Israel. Now, they were literal feasts that they practiced certain days of the year. But at the same time, they were prophetic for they foretold the calendar of God. They lay out in these feasts, whenever we look at them, we can see God's calendar laid out in this chapter. And so we're going to take that, we're going to look at that, and then we're going to jump over to the book of Revelation. We'll probably need another week or two after this week to get through these feasts because the more I get into this, the more I see to bring back to you. So I don't want to get in a hurry. I don't want to skip over a whole bunch. I want to focus. If we need to focus on something here, we'll take our time. We'll focus on that. When I, then we'll get to Revelation here probably in about two or three weeks. We should get to the, uh, to the book itself. But last week I gave you, I want to run over a couple things that I, that I uh, presented to you last week because you need to keep them in mind. Uh, two, major, two major thoughts as, you, as we go through this. Uh, number one is this. We got to always keep this in mind. Jesus Christ is the central focus of the entire Bible. Never forget that. The entire Bible points to Jesus Christ. It's all about him. Okay, here's where, we, uh, here's where we can get that from. Hebrews 10, 7, uh, Jesus speaking, says this, Then said I, lo, I come, and then you have the parentheses, In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. In the volume of the book it is written of Christ. So here's what we know. Jesus Christ is the central focus of the entire Bible. So we can take these feasts and we can say this, Somehow, some way, they point to him. They point to him. We just need to find out how that is. And so that's what we're looking at. The second thing that we need to remember as we go through all of this is point number two. The feasts were shadows of something better in the future. They were only shadows. All of this, this old covenant was just a shadow of something better that was to come. Jesus Christ came and he introduced a new covenant that was better than the old covenant. The old covenant was with all their ceremonies and all their rituals and their feasts and their, their days and their weeks. That was all, that was, even their worship in the tabernacle, that was, all of that was shadows of something that was far better that was to come. Paul wrote this in Colossians chapter 2. Verses 16 and 17, he says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink. In other words, don't let anyone, don't let anyone say, Well, you got to eat this, you got to drink that, or in respect of a holy day, of a feast, say, Well, you got to keep this feast, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. He says, Don't let anybody put you under that. Don't let anybody tell you, You got to keep these things. Because he's saying this, watch the next verse, which are a shadow of things to come. That's putting people back under the law. Christ was the end of the law. And so therefore, in Colossians 2.16, Paul makes it very clear that all of those things of the Old Testament, they were shadows of that which was to come, something far better which was to come. And that's something that was far better is Jesus Christ. All of these pointed to him. All of these were shadows of him. 
And so therefore, we're looking at these and we're seeing that in these feasts. But at the same time, we're going to see this calendar that, that God has laid out for the ages, all the ages to come. And, 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 and so we're going to pull all of this together to look at these feasts each, each individually. Now, before we go there, there's something else. The first thing we looked at last week was the Sabbath. Let me, let me run over that one more time. Watch verse 1 of chapter 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. Even these are my feasts. Six, six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest, the holy convocation. You shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, last week I told you, you come to these feasts and you say, Why is that inserted at the beginning? Why do I need to know that? Listen to me. Because the rest that God has for his people is so vitally important. That is the key to the Christian life. That's the secret to the Christian life, to understand that rest. We talked about that last week. I told you this. We do not rest in a day. That's all done. That, was, that, that Sabbath day was a shadow of something better that was to come. Right here you see it. Let me read this. I backed you up a little bit. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of a holy day or of a new moon or of the Sabbath days. Here we go. Which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So the Sabbath itself was a shadow of something that was far better to come. And that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Now, I'll get to that in a moment. But I want to just, I got to get back on this just for a little bit. Because listen to me, we live in a time when we as believers need to know about the rest of God, I'm telling you. With the world and the news that is out there in our world and in our nation today, I'm going to tell you something, it'll drive you crazy, it'll discourage you, it'll depress you. And if you're not careful, you'll just kind of think, boy, oh boy, it's all out of control. Listen, God has a rest for us, not in a day but in a person, and I'll get to that. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. But let me give you a picture of it. I touched on this briefly last week. The land of Canaan that God had promised to the nation of Israel was a picture of that rest. Canaan was not a picture of heaven. It was a picture of the rest that God has for his children. A lot of people say, well, Canaan is a type of heaven. You, whenever you look at Canaan, you see heaven. That doesn't fit because there were battles in Canaan. There's not going to be any battles in heaven. So it, it's not a type of heaven. It's a type of rest. Now, if we took time this morning, we could go to the book of Numbers. And in the book of Numbers, whenever Israel came to Kadesh Barnea, Moses sent out 12 spies into the land. They went into the land, and they spied out the land, and they came back. Ten of them had a negative report. Two of them had a positive report. Ten of them said there's no way in the world that we can enter in to that land because there are giants in the land. We were like grasshoppers in their sight. We don't stand a chance. There were two of them, Caleb and Joshua, that said, we got to trust God. God had promised to us that he would give us the provisions to conquer the people of that land, we need to go in. They chose to believe the 10 instead of the two. And so Israel never got in. They did not get in under the leadership of Moses. They got in under the leadership of Joshua 40 years later, but they did not get in underneath the leadership of Moses. But listen to this. The writer of Hebrews talks about that and he says something when you begin to understand this that helps you to grasp on to the picture watch hebrews 4 1 and 2 and then verse 6 oh, hold on wait don't let, i'm not going to read again let me give you the background the writer of hebrews is writing to hebrew believers jews that have come away from judaism there's pressure on them major pressure pressure persecution they're thinking about going back to judaism they're thinking about walking away from christianity going back to judaism 
to offer sacrifices at the temple because whenever the book of Hebrews was written, the temple still stood. So they had been ostracized from their community. They couldn't get into temple anymore because they had turned to Christ and walked away from Judaism. And so, so therefore, they're under persecution. To go back to Judaism, to go back to that old covenant and all the sacrifices, the blood of the bulls and the goats would keep them from finding the rest that God had for them. Watch what the writer Hebrews says now. He says, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Now he's writing to Hebrew believers, and he has in mind Israel in the wilderness. When they came to Kadesh Barnea and they believed the negative report of the 10 spies instead of the report of Joshua and Caleb, and they wouldn't go. He says, so let us fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his, re into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of, us, short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. Hold on. Now, when you see the word gospel there, don't think that that's the good news that Christ died, was buried, and rose again the third day because he hadn't done that yet back in the Old Testament. And it says, for unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. The gospel here just means good news, the good news that God has a place of rest for his people. That's what it's referring to here. Watch this. But the word preached did not profit them. Why not? Watch this. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Okay, here was the deal. They believed the report of the, the negative report of those 10 spies, and they said, we're not going to go in the land. Let us just get a new leader. Let's go back to Egypt and live. They never, and that group did not enter in to the, to the land of Canaan. They would wander in the wilderness for another 38 years. God said, all your numbered men are going to die. 605,000 numbered men would die over the next 38 years. I think that's about two and a half men an hour would die. They missed it. They missed it. They missed that rest. And then the writer goes here in verse 6. I'm jumping you down on the, on the bottom of the screen here. Watch what he says. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter in, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Now listen, they didn't get into Canaan. They didn't get into that picture of that rest because they didn't believe in the promises, the provision, and the power of God. God has a rest for us today, not in a day, but in a man. The man is Jesus Christ. You say, how do I get into that rest? You rest, listen to this, in the promises the power and the provisions of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In other words, listen, we don't, not, we don't function out of fear, out of, out of stress, and out of worry. God never wanted us to operate that way. God wanted us to operate out of his rest. And so we rest in Jesus Christ. And we know this, that no matter how difficult life becomes here on this earth, that we have a Savior that is in control of everything. No matter, no matter what goes on in our nation, even though God has abandoned our nation and lifted the restraints off of our nation, he has not abandoned those of us who are the church. And he is still in control, and he's working everything to funnel it down towards that tribulation period. And whenever you get a hold of that and you learn to rest, in the fact that God is in complete control, then you understand the secret, the key to the Christian life. Because you and I don't have to worry. We don't have to stress. God has it all under his control. And I'm going to tell you something. If ever we needed to know that, it's now. With what's happening within our nation and across the globe, we need it now. We need to know that. We need to learn to rest in, in, in Jesus Christ. We don't rest in a day. We rest in the man. That was, day was only a picture. It was only a shadow. Christ is the fulfillment of that. He's the central focus of the Bible. So, back to our study again. Now, that rest is very important 
because we'll apply that to every one of these points, every one of these feasts as we come through here. That's why it's at the beginning. We'll get into that. Let me show you next, the other point we talked about. I'll just hit this one real quick last week. We looked at the Passover feast. That was seen in, uh, watch verse 5 of chapter 23. It says this, In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. Stop right there. Then it's in the next verse, we're going to go into the next feast. But, but here was the point. That Passover pointed back to Exodus chapter 12. We talked about that last week. When God brought the plagues upon Egypt, the 10th plague being the most severe would be the death of the firstborn. God said, here's what I'm going to do. He said, you're going to take a lamb and, and you're going you're to keep that lamb and then you're going to sacrifice that lamb and you're going to apply that lamb, the blood of that lamb to the doorpost and the door lentil. And then whenever I come through the land at night and I see the blood, I'll pass over you. Thus became the Passover feast. But that was all a picture of Jesus Christ. He is the Lamb of God. And under his blood, we are protected from the judgment of God, just like those people were back there in Exodus chapter 12. We are protected under the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb of God. That Passover Lamb, that Passover feast was a picture of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. I told you this last week. The blood on the door posts and the blood on the door lentils, if you continue those two lines, they form a cross. The one went up, the other one went across. That was a picture of the cross that was tucked back there because that Passover feast for that, that Passover lamb and the blood that all foretold the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We looked at all that last week. Now we come to where we are today. The Feast of Unleavened Bread. Watch, if you would, starting, let me catch, uh, let me start in verse 4 and read through verse 8. These two feasts, the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, are just like bang, bang, right after each other. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which you shall proclaim in your seasons. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day, that's the following day, the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread, and the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. But you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days, and the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein. Now here's the deal. On the 14th day of the month was the Passover. The following day was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They were, to, they were not to use any leaven in their bread. Now, leaven is, was a yeast. It caused the bread to rise, and leaven would spread through the entire loaf. But leaven is a picture in the Bible of sin, and that's what we need to understand. To get the picture of what, the, what God wants us to see here, we got to understand that leaven is a picture of sin. Let me show you something. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 seven and eight here's what it says your glory is not good paul says know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump purge out therefore the old leaven that ye may be a new lump as ye are unleavened i underline that ye are unleavened he says i'll come back to that for even christ our passover is sacrificed for us there's the passover lamb therefore let us keep the feast not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So leaven is a picture of sin in the Bible. So you say, okay, then what's this have to do with it? You got the 14th day, you have the, the Passover lamb that died, that, that was a picture of Jesus Christ. Then on the 15th day, you have the feast of unleavened bread, whenever they were not to use any leaven, whenever they baked the bread. What's the significance? Listen to this. This is absolutely amazing. The Passover feast, of course, was a, sh was, a, was a shadow of the sacrifice of Christ and how we were protected from the judgment of God. But that was not the only reason why he died. Jesus didn't just die on the cross to protect us from the judgment of God, though that's one of the, that's one of the reasons, but that's not the only reason. 
Another reason that he died on the cross was this, to take away the sin from the believer's life. To take away sin from the believer's life. And that's the meaning of the, of the unleavened feast. That through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, he has died so that sin can be removed from our lives. That's the picture here. It comes the day after. It comes immediately after that they were to bake the bread with no leaven. You've got to understand that whenever Jesus Christ died on the cross, he didn't just die so that we won't go to hell, but he died to set us apart from sin. He died to sanctify us. Watch this verse. 1 John 3, 5. And ye know that he was manifested, that was Christ, to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. He died to take away our sins. He died to, to sanctify us, to set us apart as holy, apart from sin. Let me go into that a little bit. Sanctif the sanctification, sanctification means to be set apart. Our sanctification, I want you to catch this, is in three tenses. Here comes the first one. The past tense. This happened, if you know Christ as your Savior, this happened whenever you accepted him as your Savior. You were sanctified positionally. Let me explain that. You were taken, lifted out of the depths of sin when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and you were baptized or placed into the body of Christ. So positionally, you were sanctified. You were set into Jesus Christ. In that place, in that position, listen to this, we are perfect in the eyes of God. Watch this one. Ephesians 1.6 to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. We are accepted in Christ. Watch this one, Colossians 2.10. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So we have been in our position. We are, we are sanctified. We are perfect in him. We are complete in him. Don't miss those words there. And ye are complete in in him let me back you let me back you up and we are accepted in the beloved it's talking about our position we were sanctified the moment that we came to know christ as our savior we were set apart placed into his body let me go to take you to the next one you have then the future tense of our sanctification that means this we will there's coming a day when you and i will be completely separated from sin completely separated from sin first john 3 2 says this beloved now we are the sons of god and it doth not yet appear what we shall be but we know that when he shall appear we shall be like him for we shall shall see him as he is there's coming a day whenever our sanctification, which we have now, is pointing to the future, when we will be completely separated from sin. That's neither one of those. The past or the future are the ones that I want to focus on. I want to focus on the present. The present tense. We are being separated from sin. Listen to me. From the time that you and I came to know Christ as Savior. If you're saved, I don't want to assume that you are. That's between you and God, and you need to search that out. But from the time a person comes to know Christ as their Savior, God begins a work in your life. Philippians 1.6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God has started a work. The moment that you accepted Christ as your Savior, God has started a work in your life. He is molding and he is shaping you into the image of Jesus Christ. He is, he is, that's progressive sanctification. That is an ongoing process that happens in our lives. We have a responsibility in that. When we are to separate ourselves, we are to live lives of separation, and then God works through that as we do that, and so we are being sanctified. We are being separated from sin each and every day. That's the picture. 
the Passover lamb, then the, the unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread, the removal of that which separates or, or represents sin. That's the picture. But let me go back to this again. That means this, and you watch this, that the person that professes to know Jesus Christ as their Savior will, and I emphasize will, if they are truly saved, they will have a changed life. You got that? I'm saying that for this reason. There are a lot of people that profess to know Christ as their Savior, and their life has never changed. That is not the mark of a believer. That is not biblical salvation. Biblical salvation says this, that when you and I come to know Christ as our Savior, then God begins to work in us, and he begins to separate us from sin. And he begins to work in our life. And if we refuse to get away from things, then God comes in and he begins to discipline according to Hebrews chapter 12. And he begins to chasten you and I. And according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if you let it go too long, then God will take you out of the world early. But the whole point is this, that that salvation, true salvation, is going to change your life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now listen. We are not perfect as believers in practice. You're perfect in your position. You are sanctified in Christ. You're perfect in your position. That's why the Bible calls us saints. You thought it described the way you lived. Uh-uh. No way. The word saint describes our position. Our practice doesn't always line up with our position. But there is, we can say this, that in Christ, you got to understand that the moment that you get saved, then the pattern of sin gets broken in your life. Let me show you something. I hope it's not too many verses to catch. Here's what John wrote, 1 John 3, 5, and 9, 5 through 9. He said, and, and, ye know, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. I already showed you that verse, but let me go on. He kind of backs that up and reinforces that. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he's born of God. Now listen to this. You read that, and, and you'll think, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Because that, the last verse says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. The idea in this entire text, listen to me, is the practice of sin. The everyday practice of sin that existed in, the, in, the, in your life or in my life before I came to know Christ as Savior. That gets broken the moment that you are saved. The, the pattern, the, the broken pattern and the... the the change in your life is a, is a mark of true salvation. Somebody that says, hey, I know Christ is Savior, and they go out and they live in their sin and immorality, and who uses, who knows what kind of language, dragging the, the Lord's name in vain, one thing right after another. Let me just say this straight up. That is not biblical salvation. I'm telling you it's not. You can profess all you want to be, but I know this. The fruit in your life will tell whether you truly know Christ or not. Because the Bible says that whenever we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, that our lives are going to be changed. That's what you see here in this picture. You have the Passover feast and you have the feast of unleavened bread. The removal of the leaven, the removal of sin, the separation from sin. That's the picture. That's what Christ came for, this first verse. And you know that he was manifest, manifested to take away our sins. 
then how in the world, if that verse be true, how could anybody say, I know Christ, and yet still live in their sin? It just will, it doesn't fit. That's like trying to drive a square peg in a round hole. It's not going to fit. It doesn't go along with the scriptures. That person that says that, I'm telling you straight up, never, ever knew Christ as their Savior. They were professors but not possessors. Let me back that up. Matthew 7, 21 through 23, Jesus said these words. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. See, there they, they got the terminology down. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? He, he said, boy, Lord, look what we've done. This is a judgment day, by the way. You're getting a glimpse getting a glimpse right there of the great white throne judgment. And they come up to him and they say, Lord, we've prophesied in your name and we've cast out devils and we've done many wonderful works in your name. And then he says this, then I will profess unto them, watch these words, I never knew you. I didn't know you once, but I don't know you anymore. He said, I never knew you. You were never saved to begin with. You were never saved to begin with. You say, well, what about this prophesying? What about this casting out devils? What about these, these many wonderful works? What about that? Well, listen, he says something at the end of this that is vitally important. He says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What's that mean? Ye that work iniquity. Let me, let me help you with that. You that live like there is no law. You, I'll phrase it another way, then you'll get it. You that live like there is no Bible. There you go. You that paid no attention to my word. You that live like the Bible didn't even exist. You went out into the, into the world and you just lived your life in sin and, and you were in immorality and, and all kinds of things and you just plunged yourself into that. You live like there was no Bible. It didn't even bother you. And I'll tell you why it didn't even bother you. Because he says, I never knew you. I never knew you. My spirit was not inside of you. You were never saved to begin with. You profess to know me, but you live like there was no Bible. You never, your life was never separated from sin. I'm going back to this again. Listen, that feast of unleavened bread coming right on the heels the day after the Passover feast is a picture of how Christ came to take away our sins. That's a great test for you to run through your heart right now. Ask yourself this, what kind of change has been in my life? Well, you could ask yourself something like this, am I sensitive to sin? Does sin bother me? Does it bother me or, or do I, can I just go ahead and flirt with sin and it doesn't bother me whatsoever? Then you better back up and look real deep because that is not consistent with what the Bible says about a true believer. It's not. A true believer, God begins a work in their life the moment that they are saved and it's progressive sanctification and it's progressive growth and separation from sin. Ultimately, one day it's going to be complete separation from sin whenever we get out of this world. Oh, there's so many areas I could go with that. You just use that for, I got to go on. You just use that to look inside your heart. And I'll say this before we get to the end that if you got a question before you leave today, if that kind of sits with you the wrong way and you're thinking, uh-oh, maybe I'm not saved, then when, you're, when we're done today, you talk to me before you leave here. Make sure you do that. Don't you dare put that off. Let me go to the next feast, this one, the Feast of first fruits. Now, we're only going to get just the first part of this because there's so much here that we're not going to we're not going to uncover all of it. We don't have time to get it all, but I'm going, to, I'm going to show you some of it. Come to verse 9 of Leviticus chapter 23. Now watch this. We'll start right here. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap 
the harvest thereof. Then you shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you on the morrow after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it, and he shall offer that day when ye come, when, when ye wave the sheaf, and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the meat offering thereof shall be two-tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor. And the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, a fourth part of a hen. And you shall, shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the selfsame day that you have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. Boy, is there ever a lot there. So let me just rapidly run you through a few things right here if I could first of all when the harvest when the barley harvest came in the spring before anybody partook of anything that's what verse 14 says and you shall neither eat bread nor parched corn nor green ears until the self same day that you brought an offering unto your God before anybody ate of that harvest here's what had to happen they had to go out and they had to gather the first fruits they brought them back, and the priest waved them before the Lord. They were offered to God. The first fruits belong to God. And so they were, they, were, they were given as an offering back to him. Okay, now you say, okay, what's this all about? What, what's this all about? Well, the Bible doesn't let us to question that. It makes it very clear. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, it says this, But now is Christ risen from the dead, watch this one, and become the first fruits of them that slept. It's a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? He died to put away sin. He rose again from the dead. And this whole feast of the first fruits is a picture of that. But boy, oh boy, there's more in it. Watch, uh, watch verse 11. Watch, watch verse 11 here. I told you that I get all wound up on this because there's so much here to see. Verse 11, and he shall wave, this is the priest, shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. Now catch this. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So I'm just going to make sure you're wide awake here. If the Sabbath is the last day of the week, the day after that would be what? The first day of the week, wasn't it? I was hoping you wouldn't say the day after the last day. You'd have been thinking, though, if you'd have said that. But listen, this was, this was to be done the first day of the week. And listen to this. It pictures the resurrection of Christ. You want to see something absolutely amazing? Watch this. Matthew 28, 1 through 6. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of of the week came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher and behold there was a great earthquake an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it his countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow and for fear of him the keepers did shake and became as dead men and the angel answered and said unto the women fear not ye for I know that you seek Jesus which was crucified he's not here here we go for he is risen as he said Come and see the place where the Lord lay. Isn't it amazing that on the first day of the week, when they were to, rec when they were to, to have the, the feast of first fruits, that was the very day that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And isn't it amazing that the first fruits are a picture of the resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's the picture. Oh, but there's more there. There's so much more there because it's got a meaning for you and I. Okay, if, if we would have lived back then and, and, and you would have brought the first fruits of your harvest and you would have offered them to God and the priest would have waved them before God, that first fruit, those first fruits would tell you this, that there's a bigger harvest coming. There's a bigger harvest coming. There's a harvest that is going to follow this. Now, these are the first fruits, and you lift them up to God. And then, and then you know this, that boy, oh boy, there's a bigger harvest coming. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, 21 and 22. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. 
For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. I'm going to read this and I'll tell you what he's saying. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Now you just, just listen to me. Here's what Paul's saying in that text. He's writing to the Corinthian believers who had been taught that there was no resurrection from the dead. The false teachers had come in and they, they persuaded these people to believe that, that there was no resurrection from the dead. Paul said, wait a minute. If dead men don't rise, then you got a major problem because if dead men don't rise, that means that Christ didn't rise. And if Christ didn't rise, then we don't have a hope. And I don't have time to run you through that whole chapter. But he gets to this point whenever we get to verse 20. And he says, listen, dead men do rise. And Christ is evident of, evidence of that. And he's the first fruits of them that slept, those that have died. He's the first fruits of the believers. And he says, for since by man came death, that was Adam. Death came into the world by Adam. By man came also the resurrection of the dead. That's by Jesus Christ. And, he's, and then he explains it, for as in Adam all die, we're all, we were all in Adam. You didn't realize this, but back whenever Adam sinned in the garden, did you know you were there? Now, don't think that I fell out of bed this morning and hit my head. You were there. You were there in the garden. You say, where was I at? You were in the re reproductive system of Adam. You were in the loins of Adam, and when Adam sinned, we sinned. Okay, so when death came on, when death came into to Adam, that means that death came upon the entire human race. Okay, now watch verse 22 on the screen again. Watch this. For as in Adam all die. We're all in Adam, so we're all going to die. Now watch this. Even so, catch this, here's our position again. In Christ... Those that are in Christ, that's the church. We have been baptized into the body of Christ. So here's the guarantee. Watch it. Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. Let me get you back to what, what, what it's all talking about here. I told you there's a lot here. Christ is the first fruits of the believers that have died. And that means this. Sin came through one man. Death came through one man. The resurrection of the dead came through Christ. And so because those that are in Christ, all shall be made alive. We are going to be resurrected. That's the guarantee. Listen to me. You and I, I need to get back to exercising. I haven't been doing it. And you say, boy, I can tell. Well, just don't say that too loud. It makes me feel kind of funny, you know, uh, but we do everything we can to prolong and, and keep these bodies alive, don't we? And, and boy, you, you just want to hang on as long as you can. I, I tell you, when I look around the world, I'm thinking maybe it'd be better just to uh, throw out the exercise and just sit down and eat, you know, and be gone with the way that the society's going. But God's got work for us, so we don't do that. But listen, we, we stretch it out. We keep ourselves as healthy as we can for as long as we can because we want to we wanna live as long as we can. I mean, that survival instinct, God put it in us. But you know, we don't have to fear death because God's got something better. I don't want to live forever in this body. <laughs> I don't want to live forever in this body. We moved to piano the other week. I'm just now healed up from that. Okay, it don't function the way that it ought to anymore. It just, it, and, the, and the older I get, it's, it creaks and it cracks and and I go to step over the fence out here to go inside the basement of the new part. And it's like, what's wrong with that leg? It only goes about two inches off the ground. You know, you used to be able to jump. Now I couldn't jump high enough to slide a piece of paper under me. But anyhow, I don't want to live forever in this body. I want the one that God's guaranteed me. And he says, look, you can, you can listen, let me get you back to this. I told you there's a lot. You can rest. In Christ and know this that you're gonna get a brand new glorified body you're gonna get a brand new one here it comes first Corinthians 15 51 through 54 behold I show you a mystery we shall not all sleep we won't all die but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump 
For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal shall put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Amen. Brand new glorified body coming someday far greater than anything that we can ever begin to imagine. Boy, I wish I had time to walk you through all that. I'll say this, it'll have flesh and it'll have bone, but you won't have any blood. Flesh and bone and no blood. It'll be like the body of Christ after his resurrection. Now that whets your appetite, I know, and we don't have time to get into it. So let me wind us down. Let me, let me wind us down, okay? And bring it down. There's so many ways to close this out today. And I'm, I'm just going to focus on one thing here in a little bit. What we're going to do as we work through here, we're going we're gonna to take this Passover feast. We're going to take the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We're going to take the Feast of First Fruits, then, then Pentecost, and, and then uh, the Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. When we get to the end, we'll pull them all together because I want you to, that'll give us the, the entire plan of God. We're gathering more as we go through this. But here's what I want you to get this morning, and I'm going to let you go home. Listen to this. I want you to understand the accuracy of the Word of God. God said the day after the Sabbath, the morrow after the Sabbath, would be the Feast of first fruits, the very day that Christ would raise from the dead, the very day. You know how long before the resurrection that was written? How about this? About more than 1,500 years. More than 1,500 years. What's the chance of somebody like Moses taking a shot in the dark back there and saying, let's just write this down. Maybe it'll come to pass. Huh. It shows the word of God is 100% accurate. When we get into Revelation, we're going to hold on to that thought. We're going to hold on to that. God's word is 100% accurate, foretold 1,500 years before it ever happened, more than that. And it happened exactly like the feasts portray it. Let me get you back to that rest thing. That's why we can rest in God's promises, his power, and his provisions. Because he's got a grip on this world. While it looks like it's clear out of control, he's got everything under control. He's working out his plan. You and I serve him. We rest in Christ. We rest in Christ. We understand that in him we are accepted, in him we are complete. We go out, we serve God, we let God work out all the details. We don't, we don't lay our ear to all the news that's going on today and, and, and let yourself sink down in a hole, though that's a battle. That's a battle, I'm telling you. But listen, God's going to work it all out. There, there, let me just give you this verse. Joy cometh in the morning. That's all you need to know. Joy cometh in the morning. Now, let me get you back one more thing. Make sure you're saved. Make sure you are saved. Make, you know, I gave you that test here this morning. Christ died to take away sin. What's your life look like? If you're not sure, talk to me before you leave today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. Lord, we could be forever. We could be weeks upon weeks upon weeks on what's listed, what's recorded here. But Lord, we got enough this morning uh, just to fill our hearts with your truth. Lord, we praise you for that. We praise you for the picture that is seen within these feasts and how accurate it is. Lord, we thank you for the rest that we have in Christ. Thank you that in a world that is full of immorality and turmoil, Lord, uh, where the, your restraints have been lifted, we know this, that you are still in control. So help us to rest in that. Father, there may be somebody here today and they don't know Christ. There's somebody here and they're, they're wondering after what we talked about this morning. And if that be the case, give them the courage to come to me this morning and say, Pastor, I need to know. I need to know for sure that when I die, I'm going to heaven. Lord, I, I now cast this message out. I cast it across the field. 
the seed's been the seed's been put out it's been sown lord we'll trust that you'll use it according to your will to glorify our savior jesus christ it's in his name we pray amen